You're listening to 91.7 FM, WSUW, in Whitewater, Wisconsin. You're listening to Rashkin Report. Thank you very much for your time. How did you manage to grow up in the Soviet Union and to remain, to honestly be speaking, a decent person who continues to improve life for those around them? In the Soviet Union, the millions were raised there of decent people that kept their personal dignity and sense of freedom and respect for people, and I do not consider that I am all that outstanding and or consider the fact that in the Soviet Union grow up people that can be respected. I do not see anything in this of, uh, of anything unique. I don't think anything is unique here. Very well. In that case, I'll say that most of those people, most likely like in the West, look at politics as something that decent people just don't do. You, on the other hand, are actively engaged, and fairly fearlessly. Didn't you feel it's unique? I do not consider that most decent people consider politics something that the decent people don't do. I think that it's so. The, the, it's the question of degree of involvement. There are some people who involve with politics like politicians, and there's people who do politics like citizens. It's obvious that first that there's more, and there's uh, latter, there's le- uh, less. But the people who uh, support the values of freedom, there's many people like that who understand and take part in politics, at least as as average voters and citizens. It's normal and natural for a person because it's a creation of comfort surroundings in their life because you don't work for space. You work for not just for society in general. A person creates for themselves the conditions of existence in which they would want to live. And so that in these conditions, people that are around him would live as well. And the fight for democracy is a fight for yourself. And uh, at this very theme, I have a question. It, uh, do you feel that you or the people who do similar kind of work in Russia, this is being done to make a country better, or is this done so that you could sleep at night because you feel like you've done all you could? Well, it's really one doesn't oppose the other. The optimal version of a society is a democratic country, a democratic state. This is uh, this kind of, this task doesn't have to occur quickly, as everybody understands. It can take a lot of work, a very very large amount of work. But this is a goal. And what really happens is depends on the person, depends on circumstances, depends on what history does. Sometimes there are these historical periods. They can be brief, they can be quick. When, as they say, window of opportunity opens up, and only from a person it depends whether he or she can use it. Uh, in any case, the question of uh, how well everything works around us, democratically speaking, depends on how much we understand the situation and are able to make correct decisions in this environment. And in this environment, you feel that you are continue to move in the right direction and do the actions that the situation demands that really you're capable of. Yes, no question. I understand it very well. For your activity, you you luckily you luckily you survived. You were physically in a fight and you suffered injuries after you spoke up about uh, the Russian troops in Ukraine. How did this episode of your beatings and your survival, how did that affect your feeling about that which you would want to do, meaning politics or improving the situation of Russia in general? 
it didn't affect it at all of my activity because I am I sufficiently understand the situation of the general risk that relates to everyone in Russia who tries to do democratic work. During Russian-Ukrainian war, this touched all journalists who came to Pskov uh, to cover these events, and they were they were risking in a very risky situation. We were all helping each other. Nothing happened that could have been changed. My intent to do what we do simply there's a new understanding which most naturally appeared that for the work that we do there could be uh, there could be a response and it can be forceful we always understood that when we deal with politics well, not everyone gets persuaded I, I was personally experienced it but I can say for sure that we did not have let's say not in our family not inside of our thoughts there was never a question of stopping the work this this thought did not occur um, Mr. Bilkovsky, news analyst Bilkovsky, made an announcement that he is envious of Boris Nemtsov because Boris Nemtsov exited this life in such a bright way. Do what? You, what are your thoughts about this? You know, first I wouldn't be quoting Bilkovsky because. I don't think it's a very sincere quote. I doubt that he's envious. I really do. I don't think it's that. So, Besides a person that participated in many specific, notorious political and ideological projects during which democracy was harmed pretty directly, barely has any standing to speak of the name of the people for the person who died and very obvious was killed for his convictions for his views and to push off from the reaction of a former Kremlin politologist I wouldn't I don't care where he works now and what he says now I don't understand the situation at all where there is an envious of a dead person, I think that, that there's something unnatural about this. There's definitely something unnatural about this. And perhaps I was using this expression to, as you said, Boris Nemtsov was uh, killed for, for that for which he believed. You continue to also do that which you believe in. Do you look at the final outcome? Or do you just look at what needs to be done and then things will take care of themselves? Well, first, everything that is being done is being done consciously. There is no things that happen accidentally. And the final outcome is a horizon which continues to be moved more th further and further. And a person evaluates their strength and hopefully moves in the right direction. How far he will go and how far he will reach in this road is an open question. It's impossible to put a task from point A to point B and then get to the point B and then say that the work is done usually the movement continues continuously and it's important that the person was sure in that he is doing what he wants to do and all of this being done voluntarily on the, out of personal reasons not being forced not by, by people by circumstances other things and this allows to to remain an internal balance and harmonious existence within yourself. I do not see this dependent on whether the goal is reachable or not today, tomorrow or the next day. It may be global. It may be unreachable within one human life. But that doesn't mean that this road shouldn't be walked. So you're like part of the play and the play will continue. Well, I'm, I'll honestly tell you, I'm not prepared to 
compare life with uh, playwriting because uh, art is, speaks of life, but it's a different genre, that stage, when there's people on stage and there's people in the audience. Life is a different situation. There's no division between audience and the players, so I wouldn't talk that we are part of some kind of play. Every lives their own life and, and makes their decisions based on their understanding. I see this just as most natural circumstance that which a person does, any person does. There's a space of life. A person decides what to spend their energy time on. That's it. That question stands before every question. There's nothing unique about it. Every person faces this question. There's no people that didn't ask themselves this question. They give different answers. People have different wishes, different motivations, different circumstances of life. But basically, the question is the same. Very well. If you look at it from the point of view of satisfaction by the job, is there a point where if this occurs, you will say that you're going in the right direction or reached some kind of a, a point, important tipping point? where you feel that your work has point and that you are pleased with the result? Or is this every day, this feeling? You know, if we're going to talk about the point that we want to reach, that we need to get to that point and, and say that I'm happy, but there's no such point. But we want to build a democratic Russia. We want that there would be different countries so that uh, people would feel like it's a democratic society, so the government would work differently. It's a global idea, and one person cannot make this so. <coughs> because if these things occur, not just one, but I cannot say that I ask myself this question every day, whether I'm satisfied by every action, because a situation of constant self-evaluation, I think, is unnecessary because people, person is busy with work, and they need to be pleased. You, you don't need to daily to evaluate your work with your big goal. You just need to change the correlation of meaning between a person and society. I do not have this need to every day correlate what was done today with the scale of the overall goal. There's life, there's work. If I understand that this is correct, direction of life and right work, that's enough to continue to do this. I do not see a necessity every day to ask myself questions whether I got 100% of what my work. No. I do not have such necessity. A person should do what they can. Sometimes it turns out more, sometimes it turns out less. I do not see any necessity to determine in me a specific criteria and to look in the mirror every day based on this criteria. So such things as end of Putin's regime or you becoming a leader of your party, Apple, that's not a goal. That's not a goal. Those are just tasks. There's many tasks in life. It's a tactic? No, 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 it's, it's not necessarily a tactic. It's, a strate it's a strategic things, but I wouldn't consider this the sun over the horizon. That if I don't see, you can't live. No, that's not how it is. I am just amazed by your outlook, which I think is actually very deep and philosophical and big, in spite of the fact how the situation that you're dealing with, that you're dealing with every day. Could you say a few words about how your parents raised you, how you developed this worldview? Well, honestly, my parents, they raised me as they did. I grew up in a family of teachers. My mother was a teacher of chemistry and biology and worked in school in the library. My dad was teacher of physics and mathematics and electrotechnics and was a, just a teacher of family with a provincial intelligentsia, with good roots that were going to the 19th century. Unfortunately, I do not know the history of the family prior to that. Maybe one day I'll be lucky and I'll manage to find something out. But we have a good um, pedigree. I mean, in terms of 19th, end of 19th century, I have an understanding of my relatives and my ancestors. 
there is some understanding that I'm a part of certain familial process and that I, I was raised, first of all, by my family. But this is not our choice. We are born as we're born, and I can say that I got very lucky. Absolutely. Such person as you, I feel, is needed anywhere. Why do you feel that your job is to improve the situation in, in Russia? I'm sorry, there's a simple saying, where you were born, that's where you used. Um, I was born in Russia. Of course, the situation could be differently. The branches of our family live in, in Vitebsk, in Minsk, in, uh, in Vyatke, in St. Petersburg. I think, I'm sure that Geograph, geography is wider even than that because family, my mom's family on a grandfather's side went very far across the world. People live in Odessa. And I know that somebody lived in the States, somebody lived in Canada. I mean, life is big and families were large. Due to large circumstances, people were choosing where they live in many states. But it turns out that my parents were born in Pskov and I was born in Pskov. That such history decided. I don't see any inconsistency that I can live and work in Pskov. For me, it's very natural. Very well. Lev, uh, there's a lot of conversations now that opposition in Russia should unite in one powerful force, in one force, and it will probably through the, your party of Apple. How is this process moving forward? What are your thoughts about this? And basically, is there a situation in Russia, the official opposition, and how real is it, though? Well, you know, the official opposition the term is unclear to me because opposition is such political force that fights for power. And how can it be official or unofficial? I don't know. It's not like uh, in Great Britain you have Her Majesty's opposition and people sit in Parliament and swear at each other. In Russia there's a difficult, different political system and I wouldn't compare that situation. There's understanding that uh, democratic political forces are not united and not single and first because of not how they view political events. Uh, most uh, of it is post-Soviet time period but even p events of Soviet period, I think that the level of contact between political parties, democratic political parties between themselves as of today is uh, satisfactory, And but I can't show uh, with certainty that the next election will be strong enough for a wide coalition. In any case, from January, since January, I've been leading these negotiations with democratic parties, and because of ethics requirements, I cannot share any details with you or personal impressions except most common ones. But I can say that the work and negotiations with politicians that are in the part will become part of Apple Yablica are going much easier than conversations with uh, specifically Paranas, a party of Alexei Navalny, because everywhere people got their ambitions and leaders want to re keep their status. And besides that, uh, it's not just about leaders. Every political leader has a team, and it's very fair that people think about their team. I personally think that a creation of a, at least a single list uh, for the upcoming elections will have a huge impact on this country. But I see that our electors are not in a, in a joint uh, thought on this question either. I know electors who are, don't want to, of, of Parnas, who don't want to merge with Apple. I know uh, voters of Yablica, Apple, that don't want to merge with Parnas. Naturally, therefore, if there's a uniting of the parties, even at the elections for the state parliament, Duma, then I think that, uh, as basis, and in the future, all political parties will join this list. We will have to make some very strong efforts to explain to society why such, un, such different political people who have such different biographies and somewhere in some places and political positions are ready to work together as a team. There's a lot of questions, political questions, of prior political period, historical period, and 
in some way I understand I understand the concerns of traditional voters of Yablaka Apple that uh, inclusion of politicians that have been uh, strong figures of state in the, in the 90s and early 2000s, specifically Mikhail Kasyanov, uh, this can have not just positive impact, but it's, it's important to listen to voters. But I understand now that the general level of disappointment of Russian people in democracy is very high, that the level of um, propaganda influence is very high. The uh, propaganda were, does its work on bigger part of society. And I feel that in Russia today, there's about, and, and outside of Russia, there's about 10 million people who would be happy, who would be ready and to vote for democratic parties and two-thirds of these parties are not participating in elections already 20 years. They just don't go to elections and they don't want to participate. So naturally there's about three to four million dollars who are, million people who are voting. You can have two parties, you can have five parties, um, but the level of democratically minded voters remains the same, about three to four million people. It's very and so the question stands, how do you explain to these people that are ready to go and vote that they, that they need to vote for one political team? If this turns out, then the situation in the country changes, then there is a democratic choice to this madness that is occurring in our Russia, in our, in our country right now. There is opportunity to formulate an alternative to the state policy because we would be part of state power. Of course, we wouldn't be able to be a lawmaking party because there's number requirements. At least 220 people have to vote for a law, but at least we can represent and um, we can also get elected in regional parliaments and other parliaments and we can... So we're do So we want to be sure that their voice is being heard through us. And this will balance out the situation in the country and at least can help uh, some kind of a dire development. Today it's a very important job to create this parliament list. And we need to join our efforts to move forward. And so the politicians and parties need to walk towards each other. Everyone needs to do part of their job and walk a part of their way. And from this desire to walk towards each other, there is no such thing. Those that are conducting negotiations, seeing that negotiations are going very difficult, and I have no ability to promise to anybody that they will be successful. Lev, to just to share American experience from a democratic country, democratic party, as you know, there's two candidates. Bernie Sanders is very different from Hillary Clinton, but in the end, whichever one of them will win the primaries, everybody understands how important it is for all of them that were either supporting or Bernie or Hillary to unite, because on the other hand, will most on the other side will be most likely te uh, Trump or Cruz, who also scares people. Such option obviously is not possible in Russia because people understand when people understand that they need to unite and vote is this because of propaganda or what it's a very different situation a completely different situation you're talking about candidates from the same political party either Democratic or Republican these people are in the same party they're talking about inter inter party within party votes and they're fighting to represent their party and presidential elections we do not are we're not talking about internal struggle it's impossible to say that these people are russian democrats and therefore democrats are are some kind of a political group no it's not like this it's a very different political setup and therefore american traditions not even talking about that traditions are raised in over decades and centuries in any case american political political tradition is not applicable to our situation here in russia if we were talking about inter-party voting yes person who wins and then the party unites behind them so the to, to win of all national elections but in this situation the process of negotiations of democratic-minded politicians 
is is way beyond inter-party system. Cliff, in that case, what is the difference between Parnas and Yablika? Is this a difference of platforms, or is this mostly a difference of personalities and candidates, those that represent their interests, like such as Navalny, and they say, people look at him and say that they don't want him in Yablika, and the people actually know what the platform and what Parnas actually stands for. There's a little bit of everything in here. If we take the big difference in positions, there is such thing. It unfortunately is turned towards history, but it in large part determines what happens today. There's a relationship uh, with the history of Soviet and post-Soviet, starting with political, of what the post-Soviet governments did, privatization, election campaigns that were being conducted with Boris Nikolaevich Yeltsin in office, and during his second presidential election, the relationship to privatization, this very big question for Russia, because privatization that was done completely took 95% of the people a chance away from them to be owners in this country, not because this was not done by mistake, this was done on purpose. It's a very big problem, is government that serves through oligarchs. Uh, and Gospodin Kasyanov, Mr. Kasyanov, worked on such stage. He was doing uh, discussions, conducting discussions about external debt of Russia, and there's a question about where did part of that money go, that money has disappeared. And he was a uh, prime minister that was there because of Yeltsin, uh, because Putin promised uh, to Yeltsin to keep Kasyanov there because they needed to cover a lot of questions and cover up a lot of things. And because at that point uh, they needed Yeltsin and they received this opportunity and Mikhail Kasyanov received a unique opportunity to be a second person in the state of Russia and decisions that were being made were just not meeting with the principal cardinal situation of the same uh, and as far as budget and as far as tax policy all of these do not match Yablukas platform and people remember that those past differences and there's people who they trust and they're ready to vote for and there's people who they do not trust and are not ready to vote for and the mix of black and white usually doesn't doesn't give gray doesn't create it usually turns out black there's a famous effect of a spoon of oil will ruin a barrel of honey and this is it's a very difficult process and there has to be shown political will and this move ahead from the point of view of uh, well, part of Parnas, let's say, because not everybody has the position that's different from Yablika, but part of leaders, or let's say notable people in Parnas, they're mostly take uh, and agree with Yablika political platform. And in my opinion, the situation in, in our life for these people has turned out that because of different circumstances they're in a different political party. So as I understand it, to take a, a common united opposite position uh, will be done based on political. People have to be certain that they're going to parliament to defend the same ideals and to reach the same goals. And just to say that we're all against Putin and therefore we're united, or the united list, I wouldn't say that. We have nationalists who are against Putin. We have socialists and communists who are against Putin. There's a lot of leftists that are opposed to Putin, but not because they oppose Putin, but because they feel that he doesn't do enough left-wing, so to say. And just to get all Putin's opponents into one political ship and uh, present this as united opposition is impossible. But to create a democratic opposition theoretically is possible. And so I have suspicion that the level of political egoism in our country so far is greater than understanding of those political risks that stand be before the country as a whole. And I don't expect the level of political egoism to decrease in the future, in the near future. But as a whole society and voters are unfortunate, don't know well enough politicians, we need to admit that Putin 
has very effectively destroyed information field uh, and uh, media because voters need to understand what the party is about, what its platform is, and uh, when they see them, their leaders every day and hear their opinion and hear how they answer questions, how they respond to political initiatives, and based on this, voters make up impression. If for the last 15 years there's been no competition in this field and many representatives of the younger generation for whom generation who are like 30 years and younger when they hear several last names of politicians they hear this for the first time they have no place to see these people if you remember Putin the first thing he started with if you remember his reforms is the reform of independent television uh, NTV not not NTV no that was uh, channel one there was a United Russia television that was owned by Berezovsky, and uh, he started with that. Putin started with this, and that's uh, there was uh, Sergei Garenko there, and weekly, or sometimes weekly, in evening news, he would uh, scramble Putin all across uh, and say bad things about him. But he started with a channel that actually made him president, and he made it his own, and NTV was the final act of the play because it was impossible to change just a few people there. It had to be, many questions need to be de determined with private property and such. NTV was already just dessert. Very well, Lev, you're supporting elections in the sense that you're working with different parties, you're trying to create a block of opposition, dem democratic opposition, naturally you're offering the, the suggesting people vote but let's say these elections will go and there will be um, machinations and there will be fraud and there and the turn and the result will be let's say you you'll at least be dissatisfied with those results is it possible that there will be some either protests or marches or some is it possible to use this vote as an op uh, opportunity or reason for further fight or do you just say, well, these elections didn't go, what do we do next? What are our next elections? What do you do? I never predict negative results. That's very dangerous in politics and it's very bad for you. In, in just, in, You always have to plan for success. Otherwise, the success will never occur. What we will do if we will be dissatisfied, we will dis decide when we're dissatisfied. Very obvious that when it turns out that that when political result is achieved even partially um, in Pskov and we received in the past uh, 10 to 11 percent in Pskov and as a result after all the elections and all the voter fraud we still had about 7 percent and that was enough to create a fraction and to create a representation because we could not control 100 percent of the election polling places that's a reason to evaluate our strength, to try to work better, and we uh, we participated in meetings of protest that happened after the December 4th, and, and there were meetings. As a part of the election, we did not plan meetings in case we lose. Politicians shouldn't lose about losing at all, just at all. It's impossible because it completely changes the mood, completely changes the readiness of the team to work. If, yeah, I'm not arguing with you at all. There's, there's programming of result. If you predict result, if you predict the outcome, it will happen. I, I can't argue with you. As a, as a person who has been elected and probably will be elected, I'm, I, you have to believe in your success. But I just feel that elections in Russia, it's its not a goal, it's part of the process, because it's expected that there will be voter fraud. its You have to consider this part of the process, what will be after that. But I see that you're saying the main thing is to win the election, when we have to... You, you are just dividing a practical question. There can be... This is not a goal. Elections are not... The goal is to change life, to build a different state. That's a goal. Election is a task, kind of a technical task. It shouldn't be taken as a governing question. 
and it cannot be decided at the same time as predicting a loss. If you're predicting, if you're predicting victory or loss, and your reaction to it, to combine these two is very dangerous, harmful. Lev, is it possible that you will become president of Russia? No, it depends. It depends on the citizens of Russia. So it's a political question. It's a political answer. What can be done so there will be people who will be fearlessly do politics in Russia and could have hope? You you talked about the idea of enlightenment. How much do you think that could be possible? No one idea can help the situa- solve the situation. Enlightenment is a in must task for democratic politicians, but it's important to win. It's important to win regional federal elections. It's important to participate in public sphere. Then there's when there's example, then there's those who will follow the leader. It's very natural process. The more that we will have victories, the more there's a chance that we will have people going next to us. It's interdependent. So victory grows to victory and defeat leads to defeat. Thank you for the conversation. You're absolutely not afraid to disagree, not with the host, not with, with whoever you're doing are talking to, but you're doing it calmly and we're getting well the job as politi- uh, politician is to in uh, understandable language to explain to people so that people could make a even form vote. We have to all of our representatives of political class we have to openly explain what we're and what we're about and not because it can change necessarily because of people views of people but because it's important to us that the society that supports us first of all it's a society understood us and and then there will be a good turnout of people. If people will not understand this, then it's possible to derail them and to distract them. But if you have this, the, the relationship between a politician and society relies a lot on the openness of position and understanding by the people of what is this person they're voting for, what is he doing. Upon creation of this understanding, a politician is stable and steady because uh, this person relies on conscious supporters, not those that are sympathetic to him, but those that understand what he does and why. It's the most important thing in politics. This is what's called victorious citizen. Um, convicted citizen. How important do you consider Internet to be? Everything's important. It's impossible to say that what is something is more important or less important. In different situations, there's different circumstances when it is not possible to communicate with people through TV. It just not doesn't exist. Then Internet becomes a very significant part of a political communication and many events occur on the internet and people communicate and discuss these events in internet influence and internet grows in front of our eyes I mean it's but that's everywhere it's not just in Russia that's in the whole world just 25 30 years ago we we used one uh, one set of methods and now we uh, all people are informed we're now homo informaticus we must be at the level of time and to know everything that's given to us technologically we need to know how to use it if, uh, the uh, instant communication that has occurred with actually starting with phones it's only understood when there is social networks and other channels of communication that allowed people regardless of their state to uh, be in the same regardless where they are on the planet and communicate across it really affects politics it's like instead of a call you got a nice pen you're still writing you're still writing the same words but before it was more difficult and now it's easier so in this sense technological progress is part of the success of politics how much do you think the worsening economic situation in Russia will affect the elections? 
it will most definitely have an effect, but it's impossible to tell how much it will affect the election because any dis disappointment, disapproval of the power uh, will have political reflections. There's people who miss Stalin so much they miss him that if it would be possible to reanimate and bring him back to life, they would be making rituals at the site. And those people are also not happy with the government. But that doesn't mean that th this will lead. It just means that, that those people during voting will look at Stalinists instead of Democrats. Because economic crisis increases the number of people who are dissatisfied, but that doesn't mean that they will uh, be all in agreement with each other. They have different political orientations. The question is, what solution do they support? To, uh, to when they vote. And that's what we're fighting for, is so that among those that are dissatisfied, most people are ready to vote for, vote for the democratic alternative, not Stalinist alternative, not fascist alternative, but for democratic. And right now, as I feel, I understand, there's about one out of ten people, and we need to get, not we, we must not lose those people, so those people wouldn't lose us as well. You're very much interested in internal politics of Russia. And what do you think about external politics and foreign politics and what can other countries do in the world to change the situation in Russia in the direction that you would agree with towards a democratic society? What can be done by other countries to help Russia to, to get on these rails? I think that the deciding vote in this situation is not outside of Russia, it is inside Russia. It's a Russian society and it will decide how to live and as I understand it, the resources right now are not sufficient to make a correct decision and I cannot say how long it will take until society will mature enough but as far as foreign politics, of course we want democratic countries to uh, in their politics to support us, but that's a question for those countries and their voters, and I can't give advice neither to uh, <coughs> European Union or United States or other countries. I think citizens are responsible for their, are responsible for their government, and I can support that when governments of other countries go to a deal with their conscience, and forget about their values that they state that makes the position of current Russian government stronger. And that's natural. But to say that external pressure is possible to change the political changes in Russia, I can't. Because until uh, society itself will make those decisions, it will just appear like there is no result, no matter, because it will not be understood by society. This impact can help in the defense of specific people, like during Soviet Union times, those that opposed the regimes, they were saved by uh, notoriety, because convicted people, uh, people out west would find out about them through diplomatic sources, and they would make it clear to Soviet government that this person is known and their fate is of interest, um, and when that would affect, it actually would affect, and uh, and that helped people. And I, I think that it, even now that can help to some people who are convicted unfairly, uh, unjustly held. And this pressure, but there is no guarantee of any sort of political solution in Russia. Um, democratic Russia can only become reality because of Russian society. No other external pressure will lead to it until society itself is ready and doesn't desire to live in a democratic country, it will not be here. Do you think the same happened in Ukraine? It is difficult for me to say in details how much exact same thing happened. I mean, as far as the deciding vote is being with the people. It always, the deciding vote is always with the people. There is a situation when other states try to create this feeling, but unless you feel like people who are banana, uh, marionettes, who are puppet states, but to affect a specific situation inside those countries from the outside, uh, 
if we talk about large states and large societies, then nobody but the people, the society itself, can determine its fate. The impact on mood, on information being provided, the openness to the world can be can have an impact, but it's secondary. It, it's never deciding factor. The same way it cannot be in Russia, and it definitely wasn't in Ukraine. You said to in an interview to Jana Nimtsova that a revolution in Russia can only be a bloody one. Uh, what do you feel could be reasons for that? Could it be the people who become hungry and angry? Is this a cross-national division lines? Is it possible to prevent this um, if the state will continue to oppose democratic reforms? In my opinion, the only alternative to the situation getting worse and more wild is this civilized political reform and turn to honest elections and return of justice and return to principal basis of democratic state. If we're going to talk about change of government, it only has to be at elections by the people who are being supported by the majority of voters and without violence. I am not prepared to project a revolution in Russia. I don't deal with this theme subject. I just feel that in a country with an insufficiently high political culture, which is currently unfortunately situation in Russia, no large changes will go in a peaceful way. It's just impossible because peaceful revolution is only possible in a situation where educated people of high political culture totally accept for themselves physical violence with those people that they disagree with. So this method of situation on society has to be excluded to begin with. And those that people talk that talk about revolution in Russia, they call to violence. They're hoping for violence. And they're hoping that through violence they'll be able to solve their own problems. They don't even think about that the situation that will become there with uh, violence will not have legitimacy as it happened with October Revolution of 1917. People just don't understand that in Russia change of government will become a uh, question of legitimacy. This question is impossible to d solve. I mean, any any forceful removal of government in Russia creates a base problem of legitimacy, which cannot be decided in no way, in any other way, except through return to some prior point such as uh, uh, Congress that was existed in 1917 and was uh, dismissed. In your opinion, Lev, what is the biggest problem that is facing Russia then at this moment? You know, I am not a supporter of globalization of problems because if we take one problem and uh, concentrate all our efforts on solving because because if we solve this one problem, then everything will be decided. That's a simplified view of the situation. I cannot to formulate this problem without making the situation completely primitive and, as I feel, create people uh, impression of simplified way, possibility to solve problems. This, this does not exist in the state. Inf information that cannot be. If it was so, then the problem of most countries would be decided much faster and much easier with a much lower price. Oh, somewhere, let's say, main problem is poverty, and we throw everything and we fix it. No. Um, I am so I'm not prepared to say that such uh, issues and such one problem can exist at all. It's an illusory feeling, a supposition that such global task can be uh, decided through fixing of one thing. Very well left and one question, what would you say to people that want to help you? To help me? Yes, then help. Uh, voters need to vote. People that are able to persuade should persuade 
and people that, and I mean just the citizens of Russia, because they are the ones impossible, if they can help financially, at my side and a regional side for the par party, and the voluntary contributions are wonderful and appreciated. The only thing that law of Russia requires is that the person who makes a charitable contribution must be a citizen of Russia. Otherwise, this contribution will not be considered lawful and will go towards by the state budget. So if people want to help, to, we're, easy, we're easy to find. And there wasn't such a case when people wanted to help and we and that couldn't help. If you want to help, we'll find a way. Thank you so much, Lev. Good luck to you, and I hope that we'll be able con to continue this conversation in the future. Very well, thank you very much. Take care. You're listening to 91.7 FM, WSUW, in Whitewater, Wisconsin. You're listening to Rashkin Report.